J'écoutais ça, j'étais sur Twitter, je faisais du Twitter, puis à un moment donné, euh, ça me tente d'écouter ça, j'ai écrit ça. Je peux partir le stream faire une coupe de game. Les risques de Messi. Tu connais-tu ça un peu, euh, la guerre d'indépendance des États-Unis? T'as sûrement vu le Patriot? C'est un peu un documentaire, un peu plus documentaire sur la même affaire, mais là, c'est pas euh, Mel Gibson. Pas tant, non? T'as pas vu le Patriot? Un film de Mel Gibson. Dans le fond, c'est l'histoire de comment est-ce que les, les États-Unis sont devenus les États-Unis. Parce qu'avant, c'est une colonie de l'Empire britannique. Ok, ok. Ben, faire une histoire courte, là. Dans le fond. Tu vois, ça, c'est le drapeau britannique. Ça, c'est les nouveaux révolutionnaires américains, genre. Euh. Non. C'est pas la guerre. Euh, c'est pas la guerre. C'est pas la, la guerre civile qui a eu. C'est ça que le monde mélange. Il y a eu une guerre civile à un moment donné entre le nord et le sud des, des États-Unis. C'est genre les, quasiment les démocrates contre les républicains, genre. C'était C'était pour l'abolition de l'esclavage. Un affaire de même. Mais ça, c'est la guerre d'indépendance des États-Unis. C'est comment ils sont devenus indépendants de l'Angleterre. Parce qu'avant, c'était une colonie de l'Angleterre. Comme nous autres, Québec, on était une colonie de la France. C'est un peu comme si, à un moment donné, le roi de France y aurait monté les taxes, puis que les Québécois auraient pété une coche, puis auraient dit « Hey, le style roi de France, là, tu vas manger un char de marde. » Parce que nous autres, on est une nouvelle nation et on est indépendant de la France. Mais c'est pas... Là, c'est en bas. Et nous autres, notre roi de France, j'imagine qu'il était chill, fait que c'était moins pire. Ou je sais pas trop ce qui est arrivé. Là. <rire> je connais moins l'histoire du Québec que des États-Unis. Fait que c'est ça, c'est comme s'il y avait... Tu sais, ils ont dit, gars, gars, vous allez manger un char de marde, là, tes taxes, toi, le roi là-bas, à 30 000 000, le de nœud d'océan, de... à l'autre bout de la terre. Tu sais, fait que là, ils sont, ils sont partis d'une révolution. C'est que t'es beau, toi. <rire> Check Jimmy qui arrive, tu sais. Hey, on va écouter ça, les gars, il reste... Euh... Il reste 5, 10 minutes. Après ça, on... je pars un jeu. <rire> Let's go. Mais c'est ça, c'est comme si les Québécois avaient pété une coche contre le roi de France, mais là, c'est les Américains qui ont pété une coche contre le roi d'Angleterre. Puis, à la fin, ils montrent que les Français viennent aider. Les Français, ils viennent faire un tour. C'est à cause de nous autres un peu, ben, de, de nous autres. Pas des Québécois tant que ça. C'est la navale française. Il y avait un gars dans la dans l'armée britannique, dans l'armée américaine, dans les révolutionnaires américains, qui était français, qui était linké avec la royauté française. Ouais, j'arrive dans 10 minutes. Il était linké avec la royauté française. Puis il était chill avec Washington, puis il était avec Washington. Washington l'avait pris comme quasiment comme son fils adoptif. T'sais. Puis il se battait, puis la faillette était hot. La faillette, il faisait des hosties skirmiches de fou. Là. Il se cachait dans le bois là, avec ses gars. Là. Puis là, il embusquait des, des convois de Britanniques qui promenaient des shit, du, des, des, du courrier, toutes sortes d'affaires. Puis il assassinait les, euh, les leaders en premier, ceux qui donnent les ordres. Les caporales, les, les whatever. Là. Le gars sur le cheval qui gueule les ordres, là, il gonnait ce gars-là en premier. Fait que là, ça démoralisait tout le reste de la troupe. Ça, il fuckait bien raide. Puis il connaissait pas le terrain, mon gars. Il se faisait niquer. Puis, euh, non, la Fayette, c'était un Français, puis il était hot. Puis, il envoyait du courrier, lui, en France, à la royauté euh, française. Puis, il disait, non, Washington, il est cool, il faut aider les Américains. Les Américains, man, ils vont nous empêcher, ils vont nous aider à empêcher l'Empire britannique de contrôler le monde. Parce que les autres, ils étaient en guerre depuis, depuis des temps médiévaux, est contre le, les Français les Anglais, là, tu sais. Puis, les Français, ils voulaient pas que les Britanniques contrôlent le monde entier, est Ils voyaient qu'ils allaient prendre l'Amérique en plus. Il, il prenait, il contrôlait l'Europe, puis là, il voyait qu'il allait contrôler l'Amérique. Puis là, ils se sont dit, Chris, si les Américains, ils se révoltent, tabarnak, il faut embarquer avec eux autres. Fait que, tu sais, il envoyait du courrier au bout au roi de France. Puis là, à un moment donné, le roi de France, il a comme fait, « Ouais, OK, si, Chris, on va les aider, là. » Tu sais, il était là, « Non, Washington, il est hot, les, les révolutionnaires américains, ils sont chill, puis tu sais, non, non, non. » Fait que là, parce que les autres, c'était des Anglais, là, ils s'en calissaient, là, ils étaient là, Chris, c'est des Anglais, d'autres. 
Mais tu sais, Lafayette, il les a convaincus. Fait que là, qu'est-ce qui est arrivé, c'est que quand ils les ont... En tout cas, là, je suis en train de vendre le punch. Là. On l'écoutait à la place, mais euh, c'est ça. C'est l'histoire de ça. Les Français étaient dans le tas. On était là. In the face of blistering American cannon and musket fire, all British attempts fail as the light disappears. For his brash assault, Cornwallis lost 365 men. For the Americans, who continued to hold their defensive line along the creek, the losses were 100. For the second time in two weeks, Washington and his ragtag army had proven their mettle against some of the best combat troops in the world. Et puis Washington, il se battait avec des fermiers, est-ce des avocats, du monde pogné sur le bord du chemin, est quasiment là. C'était tous des volontaires qui venaient de tout partout, là. C'était même pas du monde formé. Il y en avait des militaires, puis il y en avait qui étaient formés, mais c'est pas tout le monde. Là. Ils se battaient vraiment, ils disent au début, là. Un bataillon ragtag. Cornwallis est convaincu qu'il a Washington cornered et résolve de finir him off à dawn. Mais l'un de ses subordinates, Sir William Erskine, warns si Washington est le général que je take him to be, il ne sera pas found dans la morning. Discovering that a northern ford provides access to Washington's vulnerable right flank, Erskine advises an immediate attack. Across the Ossenpink, Washington lays out the stakes for his officers. The loss of this army might be fatal to the country, but a retreat in the face of the enemy would also have lasting negative consequences. They were in a double bind. American Brigadier General Arthur St. Clair proposes a novel solution. The roads northward appeared open. The army could move out of danger, outflank Cornwallis, and take Princeton. And so, Nick, Despite some Nick naysayers, said, all soon agreed it was a time. American Brigadier General Arthur St. Clair man. proposes a novel solution. The roads northward appeared open. Check on the map of Dota, man. J'aime Nick et Seb, tu vois tout ça? T'as l'ennemi en haut, avec son ancient. T'as l'ennemi en bas, pis t'as comme la, la lane ici, qui repart jusqu'en haut. Pis t'as la lane ici, pis t'as la mid lane. T'sais, t'as comme euh, la rivière. Ben, ça, dans Dota, ça, c'est la rivière ici, pis t'as la mid lane. Pis Washington, il fait un hostie push par ici, man. C'est vraiment un hostie de strat de rat Dota, man. Washington, là, il y, y a Rat Dota, man, la bataille de l'indépendance. Littéralement, là. C'est genre du pure Rat Dota, man. The army could move out of danger, outflank ça fait triper, man. Check ça, man. Despite some naysayers, all soon agreed it was a daring option. Pendant que tout le monde n'est pas prêt à... Tout le monde est au milieu de la map, est-ce qu'il lui push? Et public opinion, Washington was sure of one thing. This move would at least avoid the appearance of a retreat. With the support of his officers, Washington approved the plan. But would they have time to move before Cornwallis attacks? And could they slip away without detection? The bright fires of the American camp, visible well into the early morning, showed that Washington's men were settled in. General Cornwallis remained confident, saying, We've got the old fox safe now. We'll go over and bag him in the morning. But the American campfires were a ruse. Left behind to cover Washington's move. At dawn, Cornwallis was shocked to discover his opponent had slipped away and was on his way to Princeton. Oh, the sir. fox had just executed way to Princeton. Cornwallis was shocked. Left behind. Le fight était supposé d'arriver ici. Il, eux autres, ils étaient supposés de traverser le pont le lendemain matin. Puis de capturer le camp ici. Parce qu'ils campaient ici. Il a laissé les feux allumés pour qu'eux autres, l'autre bord, parce qu'ils ont essayé de pousser toute la journée puis toute la nuit. Puis ils n'étaient pas capables s'ils se faisaient dégommer sur le pont. Fait que le général a dit, attendez, là, on, va le prendre, on va le prendre demain matin, même que les gars s'aient endormi ou de quoi. Là. On va attendre un peu. Fait qu'ils ont laissé, l'autre bord, ils ont laissé les feux allumés. Puis ils sont partis, est-ce qu'ils dans nuit? Par un est-ce Fait que là, pendant qu'eux autres, toute la, 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 la grosse force était ici, mais il n'y avait plus rien ici de ben bon. 
c'était moins gardé, si tu veux. Ils ont poussé. Ici, c'est les, comme les, les places du général. <coughs> Cornwallis. <coughs> At dawn, Cornwallis was shocked to discover his opponent had slipped away and was on his way to Princeton. The fox had just executed one of the most brilliant flanking maneuvers in military history. It's a rat though. <clears throat> Washington marched his army in two columns throughout the night to Princeton. As the Americans approach, Colonel Charles Mahood, moving south to reinforce Cornwallis with 450 grenadiers, Scottish Highlanders, and dragoons, spots Nathaniel Green's force. Assessing the situation quickly, Mahood immediately attacked. Les autres s'en allaient, ils partaient de là, puis ils s'en allaient reinforce en bas. Là, ils font comme, hey, wow, si, t'as un gros crise de tapon de monde qui monte la route, c'est en haut vers Princeton. Fait qu'ils se mettent à engager. Across a rising field. Il y en dette, en tout cas. On le laisse rouler, par exemple. The battle begins on clock form. Ça, c'est la pause dans le, patri dans le Patriote, on le voit, ça. Mais c'est comme une maison de ferme, là, puis là, ça, ça part, puis c'est comme la maison de... En tout cas, c'est pas, pas tout à fait pareil là, dans le film Le Patriote, là, mais c'est comme la maison de... de comment il s'appelle, là? Euh, du, 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 du main héros, là. Mel Gibson. Avec sa famille. Là, il voit le combat puis il tire par la fenêtre. Là. The British surround, taunt, and bayonet Mercer, leaving him for dead. The arrival of a force under Cadwallader staves off defeat. Aided by a pair of four-pound cannons, they slow the British onslaught. But even these efforts prove insufficient, and Cadwallader's men soon begin to give way. Washington himself arrives on the spot. Les gars avaient pris un, mon gars, un mousquet à six pains de couvert. Rallying with the cry. Parade with us, my brave fellows. Leading his advance, they force the British to break and run. Galloping after the broken remnants, Washington shouts. It is a fine fox chase, my boys. It is a fine fox chase, my boys. Leaving it to the Americans. The British were retreating. In just a matter of weeks, Washington and his army had shattered the illusion of British invincibility. Washington had won at Trenton twice and drove the British from Princeton. Now he contemplates yet another roll of the dice. Brunswick holds a tantalizing cache of stockpiles and few British defenders. But with little sleep in the past two days, his troops are beyond exhaustion. So on January 7th, Washington and the remainder of his victorious army. This is the difference, is that in this time, in this time, in this conflict, the general is almost in front. C'est malade, là. Ça, c'est une vraie guerre, là. C'est pas comme une petite patente organisée pour faire de l'argent, genre. Pour que les grosses compagnies qui font des avions et des missiles, ils fassent full, ils fassent full profit, là. C'était une vraie guerre de vrai monde qui se battait vraiment pour leur survie, puis pour libérer leur terre, genre. Puis Washington était comme dans le tas, puis let's go, genre. C'est son cheval en avant, un peu comme Napoléon, quasiment. Harassing the British and raiding the countryside, eliminating their supply routes and sources of food. Like a thousand wasp stings, the raids are the only thing that you can do to the relatively safe in the New York City. With his army now safely positioned around Morristown, Washington was forced to confront an even deadlier enemy, disease. His battle-worn citizen soldiers Huddled in winter encampments were prime targets for the great killer of the revolution, smallpox. 
fearing discovery through British agents, Washington boldly orders that his entire army be quietly inoculated. This action, mandated in all Continental Army camps, would save countless lives, lives of the very soldiers who would continue the fight for freedom. Facing what seemed to most on both sides as certain defeat, a ragtag force of Continentals had stunned the British and the world. Washington's bold stroke across the Delaware led to the defeat of three different Hessian and British forces in one brilliant campaign. The once mighty British army, numbering 31,000 in the summer of 1776, had now been reduced to less than half that number, and its great gains of territory had been largely wiped away in New Jersey. Frederick the Great, King of Prussia, and one of the world's great military minds, called Washington's exploits those 10 fateful days, the most brilliant of any recorded in the annals of military achievements. At the center of this great strategic reversal stood General George Washington, undaunted by the staggering losses of the summer of 1776. He provided the critical leadership that saved the remnants of the Continental Army and compelled them to victory at Trenton and Princeton. His strength, tempered by flexibility and an open ear, built an army able to absorb defeat, win victories, and able to turn the dream of a new nation into a lasting reality. Il y a une autre partie. Mais on l'écoutera pas aujourd'hui. C'est la partie avec les Français dedans. Je sais qu'elle était bonne là-dedans, tu sais. Ça les a, ça, les Français qui arrivent ici. Ça les a, tu sais, ça. War's fifth year came to a close. The prospects for American independence never seemed so bleak. The euphoria brought on by the victory at Saratoga, New York, and the French commitment to aid America, both financially and militarily, had long since died out. American defeats to the South at Savannah, Charleston, and Camden only furthered the growing sense of despair. Morale was low. Mutiny lurked within Washington's ranks. Ex-American General Benedict Arnold, whose defection and treachery seemed to signal a broader problem among the population, now led British forces, raiding unchecked into the heart of Virginia. Inflation and shortages of hard money meant Congress could not even pay the soldiers defending their cause. And rumors swirled that the French, pouring what amounted to billions in current dollars into the American war effort, were having second thoughts about their involvement in what had become, for them, an expensive global conflict. At his headquarters in New York, Commander-in-Chief George Washington <coughs> saw the present crisis unfold and observed we are at the end of our tether, and now or never, our deliverance must come. The long streak of British victories would end as they continued their advance into the Carolinas. 
A recently formed American army under Nathaniel Green Get that boy. harassed Lord Charles Cornwallis' troops as they marched endlessly through the rough Carolina backcountry. <laughs> the British were stung with losses at Kings Mountain and Calpins, coupled with devastating casualties suffered at Guilford Courthouse. Tired of the inconclusive fighting in the Carolinas, Cornwallis made the fateful decision to march his army north to Virginia. It is here, in the home colony of Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Patrick Henry, that Cornwallis hopes to not only stop the flow of supplies into the Deep South, but to also make Virginia the seat of war, even at the expense of British control of New York. General Sir Henry Clinton, Cornwallis's superior in New York, is angered by the move into Virginia. Not only is it a blatant disregard of orders, it risks wiping away the hard-fought British gains in the Carolinas. Plus, with the news of the French fleet's operation in American waters, Clinton is no longer certain that he can safeguard Cornwallis's position in Virginia or transport him safely elsewhere. Despite these doubts over his strategy, Clinton sends reinforcements south to his aid. By May 1781, since the arrival of French forces in 1778, the Allies have yet to produce a significant victory. Repeated failures had created confusion and distrust amidst the Franco-American alliance. And by 1781, ouais, he thinks a combined Allied strike against the British stronghold in New York could end the war. But the Comte de Rochambeau, commander of the French forces, doesn't agree. Though a more experienced officer than Washington, Rochambeau has orders to obey the American general's chosen strategy. At a strategic conference with Washington in Connecticut, Rochambeau makes the case that New York is too difficult a position to attack. Both commanders are aware of a large French fleet sailing in the West Indies and that it's available to operate off the American coast before returning to France. Washington wants it to sail to New York. Rochambeau has another idea. In the waning moments of their conference, the French commander secures a vital concession from Washington who agrees to move his army elsewhere Provided that the French fleet de Rochambeau et tout, hein? Il aurait pas eu le même plan. What Washington doesn't know is that Rochambeau has already written the fleet's commander, Admiral Francois Joseph Paul, Comte de Grasse, with a strong directive for him to sail not to New York, but toward Cornwallis in Virginia, to the Chesapeake Bay. It's a move that will reap significant Allied advantages in the months to come. Meanwhile, Washington's plans for an attack on New York remain frustrated. Much-needed men and supplies for the attack have failed to materialize. Amidst the ongoing stalemate, Washington learns on August 14th that de Grasse's French fleet has been directed to the waters off Virginia. He confides to his diary that matters have now come to a crisis. Stay the course with the attack on New York or gamble all on this new opportunity in Virginia. He faces a crucial strategic choice that must be made quickly. To take advantage of Cornwallis's precarious position, he must move his and Rochambeau's armies overland to Virginia and give up his aims for New York. The march south is filled with risk. Can the French fleet and the small American army in Virginia hold Cornwallis in place long enough? Will Clinton at New York 
even allow his French and American forces to move south. Despite these great concerns, Washington decides to change course. He will move south and attack Cornwallis. Il y avait des Clinton l'autre bord. <coughs> Je sais pas si ça a rapport avec les Clinton. Since his arrival in Petersburg, Virginia, on May 20th, General Cornwallis's combined army of 7,200 men had been unable to bring the Marquis de Lafayette's wily American force to decisive battle. The Frenchman turned American general was Washington's favorite. In Virginia, he described his role as one reminiscent of the terrier baiting the bull. But his small army bought Washington needed time. As he ponders his next move, Cornwallis received a set of contradictory and confusing orders from Clinton. In one, a nervous Clinton requests reinforcements for his threatened position in New York. Then another proposing a march toward Philadelphia. And then a third ordering him to stay put in Virginia. Ultimately, the two British commanders decide that Cornwallis's army will remain along the Virginia coast. Il fait niquer la suite. Oui, on capsule d'eau, puis on va écrire des lettres à sa place. Oui, on force à écrire de quoi. Yorktown is a strong position. Tu vas envoyer un message à l'autre, tu vas dire telle affaire. Tu vas mettre ton saut là-dessus, tu vas faire ma dialogue, c'est mon petit délai. Que le gars, il y a reçu trois lettres. Fais ci, fais ça, puis non, finalement, il fait rien. Hein? C'est son écriture, ouais. It is this assumption that will prove disastrous for the British. Ça fait bizarre cette botte là. Il a reçu trois lettres à écrite. Je peux prendre mon temps. Armed with Rochambeau's directive, De Grasse sails north from French-controlled bases in the Caribbean on August 15th, using Virginia pilots and sailing the smuggler's route. He arrives at the Chesapeake two weeks later. His fleet is 29 ships of the line, four frigates, and 3,200 hey, French ships. The British quickly realize that it will take a victory by their Royal Navy to reopen any escape by water. Sailing south from New York, British Admiral Thomas Graves and a fleet of 19 ships of the line arrive on September 5th to find the larger French fleet blocking the entrance to the Great Bay. No, it's possible. You see? No. By 4 p.m., the two lines begin to exchange blistering cannons. There are two bateaux, it's for a bateau. Yes. More suited for pistols. One point five bateaux, it's for a. Change in the wind uh, direction forces Graves to stand off. With the sun beginning to set, damage to his fleet mounting rapidly. Graves Il y a un bon qui a plus de DPS qu'il y a là. That's it. L'école, c'est ça. Though inconclusive tactically, the Battle of Virginia Capes was the first major naval defeat ah, of the DPS, British ouais. by the French since 1690. Graves' retreat to New York leaves control of the Chesapeake and Cornwallis' escape route firmly in the hands of de Grasse's French fleet. Washington is in a race for time. Not only must he reach Virginia before de Grasse's fleet departs the Chesapeake in October, he must also deceive Clinton long enough to allow the Allied force to reach Yorktown before Clinton can respond. As the American and French armies prepare to march away from New York, Washington sets in motion a plan of deception. False papers ordering an attack on New York are purposely lost so the British can find them. Fake camps, complete with telltale bakeries, are produced within view of Clinton. Les faux camps, si, ah, ils vont attaquer les gars, man. ils se préparent, il y a des camps. Clinton waits for an attack that never comes. Despite the hot sun, endless marching, hopes of a decisive action grow within the Allied ranks. Ils attaquent, il y a des papiers, on a trouvé des papiers, puis tout, puis il y a des camps. 
Washington rides forward to Mount Vernon, his home that he had not seen in more than six long years. There, he and Rochambeau refined their war plan. By September 26th, all their armies have assembled just 13 miles from Cornwallis's line. Despite the Allies' great fortune so far, Washington must act quickly to dislodge Cornwallis from around Yorktown before the French fleet retires to safer waters. again, with earthen redoubts protected by sharpened poles called phrases and palisades to protect the defenders. Cornwallis's artillery is arranged to harass Washington's army and keep them at bay. Reduced by sickness and wounds, Cornwallis is still able to place 5,500 veteran British and Hessians into the fortified lines, some of the best soldiers in the world. Despite these defenses, Cornwallis is soon in a perilous position. By October 3rd, the Yorktown and nearby Gloucester positions are surrounded by the growing Allied force. Augmented by the recent arrival of heavy siege guns, Washington has 18,000 French and American soldiers ready for action. Relying on Rochambeau's experience in classic siege warfare, Washington orders the Yorktown operation to commence. The plan is for American and French forces in the dark of the night to dig parallel trenches, inching ever closer until their artillery is in range to begin breaking down Cornwallis's earthen defenses. The siege and victory, claims Rochambeau, is now reducible to calculation. Ever since arriving at Yorktown, hundreds of French and American soldiers had been on constant rotating duty, Il y en avait à temps building the Français. massive infrastructure needed to support the mm. planned half-mile siege line. On October 6th, Rochambeau's design is set in motion. Under the cover of a rainy night, 1,500 men were <laughs> along a line marked by pine boards. 2,500 men move ahead to defend them from attack. Sinon, je m'en calisse un peu, je pense. Yards C'est très hot, pareil, là, mais... This first parallel line is ouais, 10 feet wide and 4 feet deep. Et là, on était là. Ah, it will house 13 artillery batteries and 4 manned redoubts. Going exactly to plan, most of this line will be filled with troops by sunrise. General Washington is among the first to break the earth with a pickaxe, symbolically beginning the siege of Yorktown. By October 9th, all of the 73 Allied cannons, mortars, and howitzers have been hauled into battery positions along the line. General Washington fires one of the opening shots. As many as 1,700 rounds eventually crash into the unfortunate town each day. Those citizens who remain are forced to seek shelter in the town. As many as 1,700 rounds eventually boulets par jour qui arrivent dans ta ville, ça commence à faire pas mal. Those citizens who remain are forced to seek shelter along the river's edge. Even Cornwallis, who had been occupying the home of former Virginia Governor Thomas Nelson, shelters in an underground bunker. of the Allies were relentless, more pressure was needed. Digging zigzag approach trenches, the Allies begin construction of a second parallel on the night of October 11th. 
This second parallel is only 350 yards from the nearest British defenses, point-blank cannon range. By dawn, they had built a trench 750 yards long. As they build the second parallel line, two advanced British redoubts, number nine and number 10, block their path to the river. The Allies will make a direct assault against these stout positions. Leading the American assault on redoubt number 10 is one of Washington's trusted aides, 24-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Hamilton. Facing the larger and tougher redoubt number nine, Count Guillaume de Dupont will lead the French assault, which includes 400 mm -hmm. veteran grenadiers and chasseurs from the regiments Gatinois and Dupont. Dupont, thank you. As night falls on October 14th, the French unleash a diversionary raid on the Fusiliers Redoubt at the far end of the British line. The combined assault begins at 7 p.m. Hamilton leads his 400-man force toward Redoubt Number 10, illuminated by signal rockets. They must cross a quarter mile of open ground as fast as they can. Lieutenant Colonel John Lawrence leads 80 Americans around the back of the redoubt, while the remainder make a frontal assault. British grape shot and shells fail to slow the Americans. After a few minutes of hand-to-hand -hand combat, they take redoubt number 10. The French have a tougher time with redoubt number 9 and face intensive musket fire. But after a savage, close-range fight, the French overwhelmed the British and Hessian defenders. At a cost of 24 men killed and nearly 100 wounded, Cornwallis is now yeah. trapped at Yorktown, and he has few options. His attempt to slow the Allied bombardment with a sortie of 350 light infantry and grenadiers yields no lasting results. A desperate attempt to flee the lines across the river fails due to lack of boats and terrible weather. Surrounded by a sick and hungry army, the smashed houses of Yorktown, and the rising stench of hundreds of dead and rotting horses, Cornwallis decides to seek the unthinkable. The surrender of his forces to the French and Americans. seeks honorable terms, which Washington rejects. He will give the British the same treatment they gave the Americans a year earlier at Charleston. Colors surrendered, and Cornwallis's men, prisoners. The British commander has no choice but to accept or face further bloodshed. At 2 p.m. on October 19, 1781, the British march from the ruined remains of Yorktown. They stack their weapons and surrender their flag. Lord Cornwallis claims illness, leaving the formal surrender to Brigadier General Charles O'Hara. O'Hara attempts to surrender to Rochambeau, who directs him to General Washington. Washington, in turn, has O'Hara surrender to his second in command, General Benjamin Lincoln, who had been forced to ignobly surrender a year before at Charleston. With Cornwallis's sick and wounded, more than 8,000 prisoners are counted at Yorktown, along with over 200 cannon, 8,000 muskets, and 2,000 swords. The British suffer 556 killed, wounded, or missing. The Allies, 389, nearly two-thirds of which were French. C'est pas beaucoup de monde pareil, là. That evening, comparé à genre euh, la boucherie qui se passe en ce moment. Production of the British Army under the command of Lord Cornwallis is most happily affected. C'est rien ça. Là. The evening of October 22nd, they issue a decree for a day and a night of celebration. When Lord North, the British Prime Minister, learns of the defeat a month later, he blurts, Oh God, it is all over. 
And while King George III continues to ask for further military actions, the war is essentially over. The defeat at Yorktown and the mounting costs of the war saps British public support for continued action. In April 1782, the British Parliament seeks out the American Ministry in France to begin negotiations. Eighteen months later, the Treaty of Paris is ratified by Congress, bringing about the end of America's war for independence and the beginning of a new nation. With the war over, General Washington shocked the world in December 1783 by resigning his commission as Commander-in-Chief. Walking away from such a powerful position prompted King George III to call him the greatest character of his age. But his retirement from public service would be short-lived. By 1787, he was elected president of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Two years later, he would become the first president of the United States. Takes house. So takes house. 